Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Voth, joined by KSU fan and Drew Galloway. It is the Sunday show. It is a sad one. K-State, not a fun loss last night against the Houston Cougars in the rain where I mean, it was pretty nasty weather most of the game. Uh, you had the delay at the start of it, and then throughout the game, it was kind of on and off with heavy rain, and, and that made some effect on the game. And there were points where it felt like Maybe when the rain was at its heaviest was when K-State was needing to kind of make their last push to try and salt the game away, so that probably didn't help. But the main thing we're probably going to end up talking about here is K-State's struggles yesterday. I, I think they win that game if it's not raining because I think you're able to throw the ball a little bit more. And I know that Avery had some struggles in the game. Obviously, he had two really bad picks. Um, there were maybe some bad reads that he made. But for the most part... I. But he came out in that game, and the passing was pretty crisp. I thought that he was on target with some guys. He was making some throws that were a little bit more timing-related, a little bit tougher on him, and he was executing fairly well. But when it starts raining like it does, I mean, he threw the ball 39 times. That's just not going to happen. You look, Zeon Chris threw the ball 11 times. Now, it doesn't help that when he threw it 11 times, K-State let every one of those passes fall into the hands of a Houston receiver. But... This really comes down to, and Chris Kleiman said it after the game, the fact that K-State couldn't run the ball against Houston is why they lost that game. You have to be able to run the ball in a game like that. And they couldn't, and this is something that I've been concerned about, not to this extent for most of the season. I mean, I, I look around and I, I thought, you know, when the yardage kind of tightens up and they get into the goal line or they're you know needing a yard or two, we've seen all season – they don't trust to just turn around and give it to a running back like you should in most cases. They're having to get kind of creative. That's why we've seen all the tight end touchdowns. Avery's having to use his legs to create. Well, yesterday we saw this completely deteriorate into them not being able to run the ball even if they were at their own 30-yard line. They just they couldn't do it, and uh, that's ultimately the reason why they ended up losing yesterday. So, Fan, I'll, I'll ask you what you saw from the couch yesterday in the K-State loss. I think you highlighted uh, the biggest one is is we've now seen two out of the last three games. Um, and, you know, KU, the running game wasn't great, but at least you got some explosives. But two games out of the last three, when you throw in West Virginia, uh, you have 114 yards rushing and then 89 last night. Um, that's not sustainable when your offense is built on running the ball, especially with uh, – inside zone, which has kind of been the staple and, and teams um, have figured out how to take that away. You know, even even if you just throw out a couple of the sacks and um, the 10 the yard loss on the the that counted as a run on the, the field goal muff, um, K-State had 105 yards rushing on run calls and under four yards per carry and a success rate of uh, 34%. And that's just not going to get it done. And it's highlighted by the conditions, like you said. I mean, when when it comes to the point where you have to run the ball and you can't run the ball, um, K-State was really sunk. And then, you know, you throw in what the running backs did. Uh, Dylan Edwards ran the ball seven times for 37 yards and had a 29% success rate. DJ Giddens ran the ball 17 times for 50 yards and had a 29% success rate. So, so when K-State's running backs, two running backs, have a 29% success, success rate considering down and distance on the on running the ball, K-State's going to be in trouble. And then I think, you know, even then, if that sounds crazy to say, but even then when you're pinned deep in the fourth quarter with a two-score lead, maybe run the ball. I mean, it's it sounds crazy to say, but ultimately when you – can't throw an interception and you throw yeah. one and give them the ball at your nine yard line. I think, you know, if K-State just runs the ball three times there and punts it, I think you guys mentioned it on the, on your, your after show, K-State probably wins that game by at least making them drive 50 yards. Cause you know, with, with the punting situation, K-State may have a 30 yard punt there, but still I'd rather force them to go 50 yards twice and score touchdowns than, nine yards and 41 yards is which their last two touchdown drives were. So just a mess uh, of a game. And in my opinion, the worst loss of the climate era. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I said it yesterday. The, Clement has only lost three times the teams with a losing record uh, since being at K State. It was 2019 at home against West West Virginia, which we, you know, that was kind of a ridiculous loss at the time um, because K State was playing well going into that game. That one made no sense. Um, but like we said yesterday, that 2019 season wasn't going to be anything more than just a whatever season. You knew kind of what your status was. You weren't going to be like a New Year's Six team or whatever. That was just, eh, okay, good first year for climbing, weird loss, whatever. Um, but then you go and look, 2020, same type of deal. That Baylor game, who cares, whatever, COVID year. Uh, Baylor only won two games that year. They were both against the Kansas schools. But, yes, this one, it's just it's inexcusable for this team to go on the road and lose this game to Houston, who, while Willie Fritz is their head coach, and there is some fight, and their defense is okay, you should not have let Houston's offense be better than your offense, especially on a day like that. And if you think that you're a running team, you should be able to run the ball. So I think a lot of this is on the offensive line. They have struggled with their run blocking throughout the season, despite what some people tried saying to me uh, whenever I would point that out. The offensive line is fine. The offensive line is fine. Um, some of this is also on DJ Giddens and Dylan Edwards. Like, it takes two to tango in the run game. And I get that you have to be set up by your offensive line. But if you are the best running back in the Big 12, you should also be able on your own to make some of these plays. It shouldn't be so reliant on your offensive line. Now, maybe that illustrates just how bad the offensive line is. I mean, you wouldn't get a straight answer out of it, but I would be interested to know um, it was the, uh, was the offensive line so bad yesterday that it made it impossible for these guys to run or would Chris Kleiman or whoever else, Connor Riley say that DJ Giddens and Dylan Edwards also share some blame in this um, because it, it was really, really bad. And now you, you find yourself in a position where you don't control your path to Arlington anymore. It's still out there. It's really as simple as you just got to win the last three games. Like we thought K state was going to have to do anyways. And then you need Colorado to lose to somebody um, and they still have to play tech, uh, Texas Tech next week. They play at KU, and then they also face Utah and Oklahoma State at home. Um, they're not going to lose at home to Oklahoma State. I guess the thought would be maybe Utah, uh, their defense could do it. But really, Colorado has to lose in the next two weeks uh, if, if you think K-State has a chance at this, or we're all sitting here with the worst scenario imaginable for the 15 other schools in the Big 12, and it's that, Deion Sanders gets to coach a team in the Big 12 championship game. So K-State royally screwed up yesterday on a lot of fronts. And I think you can blame the players. They were all bad for the most part yesterday. I mean, the secondary, you were barely tested in the game, but when you were, F, 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 F. I mean, the Keenan Garber pass interference was just inexcusable, and we see it too much from this secondary. The ball is going to be in the air, turn around, and try and do something. Like, at least act like you're trying to not get a pass interference penalty. Don't be so defeated that you're like, ah, this guy's going to beat me anyways because I'm bad in coverage, so I'm just going to get the pass interference call, and I'd rather have 15 yards than a bomb given up on me. That's okay in some situations. But when every situation seems to end up that way, have a little bit of fight, have a little bit of pride, and I think the secondary has been weak in that spot all season long. And, uh, I mean, the other guys on defense, there really wasn't a ton of time to get pressure on Houston when they threw the ball because it's not like they're they're trying to bomb it down the field. Um, it was going to be a tough game to rack up sacks. They, there were only a handful of, of runs that really popped on them, and that's what was missing in the game for K-State. It was the explosiveness in the run game. That's why Houston was able to do what they did on offense, where honestly very similar to the Iowa State game last season for K-State, where – K-State didn't get any of those explosive runs that Iowa State got. And that probably highlights more of a K-State problem on offense than it did a K-State problem on defense. Because in this bad weather, you would think eventually somebody's going to squirt out of there and, and pop something off. And I kept thinking as that game got later, okay, maybe that's going to happen for K-State here. But it didn't. It was horrendous. Uh, Drew, your thoughts on the meltdown yesterday? Yeah, I, I would agree that this is the worst loss in the Chris Kleiman era. Um, 
because also like 2019 uh, West Virginia and 2020 Baylor, it, it's not even just like a, the season circumstance. I think it's game circumstance. Houston was pretty much dead to rights until that interception. Like it, it was 19 to 10. And in the press box, we were just thinking like, this is the time where running three times and punting is okay because the clock will run. Houston's offense hasn't been able to move down the field, and they and they really weren't the entire game. All of Houston's scoring drives were on short fields. So you were probably okay with just punting there if you would have had the if you would have had to, and you probably would have had to because I've talked about how the, the secondary needs to do some soul searching all season. The offensive line needs to do some soul searching and looking in the mirror after that game. Because that, that that's a team that they they are okay at run defense, but in a in a game like that, you have to be able to run the ball, and they just weren't good enough in that area. It, and Chris Kleiman actually did say that, like when they were able to sustain blocks and uh, keep on their run blocking, that they still have to break an arm tackle, and that the running backs aren't very good at that right now. Like the the whole run game a, as a whole was pretty much as bad as I've seen it in the, in the climate era. Like last year, Texas was up there, but considering what Texas had at that point with so many future NFL guys on their defensive line, th- that makes yesterday worse because it, it, I would consider Houston's secondary more of their strength than their defensive line. And, and K-State's offensive line just got worked yesterday. Uh, I mean, defensively, I said that that was probably – if you take away the explosives, and you can't, obviously, but that was one of the best performances that the K-State defense has had all year. Houston wasn't able to really do anything when they had the ball, which, again, just goes back to the point of when you're up nine with 12 minutes to go in a game that's in a torrential downpour. We were talking uh, before we started recording. Rice and Navy was supposed to kick off at the same time slot in the same city and it, there was so much lightning and rain in the, in the area that that game didn't get over until 11.30. So you're playing in that rainstorm, and you're telling me that the best thing that you could do to win was to throw the ball? I, I get that it was an RPO, but I feel like that's even one of the, Just hand it off. Just hand it off. Because you, you can punt three times, you take time off the clock, and, and even if Houston scores on that next drive, because you ran the ball three times, they're still going to have less time on the clock to potentially score that second time. Well, and and the other thing that I would bring up here, and I'll ask you guys about this. I mean, in some ways, yes, the the performance by the players yesterday was terrible, but the people in charge of these 18 to 23-year-old players are 50-year-old grown men who I think got complacent and were unsure of what to do yesterday because I think they were probably a little in their heads about what they needed to do offensively. And I don't know if it's an outside noise type of thing got to them and how they were thinking during the game. I would like to think that that's not the case, but it could have been because we've seen in a lot of other scenarios this year or past years, the play calling and the decision making can get pretty conservative with this staff. Why do you guys think it was that yesterday they decided and thought, oh, we have to throw the ball here. We can't trust the run. Like, I get I get the the run game sucks right now. The offensive line's terrible. Our running backs can't break anything. But in that moment, in that rain, up by nine points, two scores, why do you think they felt that they had to put the ball in the air in really some risky situations like throw – I talked about how good Avery was early, but once the rain starts coming, I those th- kind of intermediate throws where guys are crossing and then it is timing related and, and you're still going to get like secondary coming up and the linebacker is going to be right there. There's going to be so many bodies that can kind of muddy that thing up. If you're going to throw it there, take some deeper shots down the field. Don't, like you ended up doing, give Houston an opportunity to force a turnover right there. I mean, it, even if you throw the interception down the field and it's picked off at your own 40, that's better than giving it to Houston. I think what that pick started around like the 20-yard line and they took it back to the nine or something. Um, so w- why do you think the coaching staff 
went the way they did yesterday and essentially also had a heavy hand in blowing this game for K-State? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. Um, I, you know, I, looking at it, we K State ran the ball forty five percent of the time, so they threw it fifty five percent of the time. That's not a good ratio for this team. I I do I think they think a RPO because they ran that RPO combo with the kind of skinny post slant route a lot and had some success on it, but they also have to realize Avery Johnson's biggest mistakes have come throwing it high. And on that throw, the worst possible thing you can have is to throw it high, you know. And, we, and we've seen most of his misses this year on those kind of throws, throwing it high, and that's the worst possible situation to throw it high. And I think it's probably exasperated by a wet ball. Like um, that's not going to make it any easier. Um, it, but it's just, you know, you're right. It's frustrating, you know. And I was just looking. K State was number 14 in the country in explosive run rate coming into this game, and Houston was number 125 in giving them up. And to just get no runs over 20 yards, it, it, I, I'm with you. I just kept thinking, we're going to pop a run at some point. We have to. We did against KU in the second half. Eventually, we're going to do the same against this Houston team. And it just didn't happen. Um, and then, you know, then you're forced. I think you get in. I think, Mason, you said it well. You kind of get inside your own head as a play caller, I think, and think, well, I know it's raining, but, you know, they're keeping the balls dry enough. Um, we've got to get a first down here. I think that's probably what their thought was. We got to get at least one first down here, and then we can go to that run it three times and punt it. And you know, I think it's just a, a, a case of overthinking. And then um, once you lose your confidence in your fastball, you know, you, to use a baseball analogy, and you have to go to breaking balls. Um, if you hang one of those, it's a bad news. And you know, I think we we saw we hung a breaking ball. And, and Houston hit one out with it. So um, just a bad combo to, to not be able to run it and then be forced to throw it and then to get inside your own head as a play caller. And then that's when mistakes happen and we saw it happen. Yeah, I, I just think that that's probably where you see the inexperience of Connor Riley as a play caller. Mm -hmm. it, it really shows up there because the run game wasn't working <laughs> and it hasn't really been working for three weeks. but he's been able to figure out something to kind of patch it together and make it work. Yesterday, because of the weather conditions, he wasn't able to really patch it together and make it work because it was really freaking hard to throw the ball yesterday. Like, it, it, it's impressive the yardage that Avery ended up throwing for. The, the two picks were just catastrophic. But to be able to throw it that well for the most part yesterday, I think is still impressive. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's the inexperience uh, as a play caller. It, and and you said it would be like a punt. With, with how K-State was punting yesterday, if you throw it deep and throw an interception there, that's probably better than a punt. Like, the the special teams right now is awful. It, it is, yep. it, it, like, K-State is losing the hidden yardage. They're losing the big plays yesterday. They They kind of got away with it a little bit. Uh, in terms of the KU game, because KU special teams made the more catastrophic blunders. But the, the special teams right now is pretty terrible and, and probably the worst in the climate era. And that, that's saying something because the, the climate era hasn't had great special teams, and, and this team might have the worst. Well, and it's also funny because the KU game, you're an inch away from the best special teams play that worked in your favor also being a bad one. I mean, K-State had already, they had kicked a, a ball out of bounds in that game later on. They also could have done it there if the, the KU return man doesn't lose his head or something. Um, but yeah, and, and the special teams, like this is a big part of it yesterday too. I, I don't want to devalue the positions, but your long snapper and holder are positions in football that you should almost never have to worry about. And I, I mean, it feels like for the last decade, that's been something that you have not had to worry about or think about, or maybe probably even longer. But I don't know that I can remember Brandon Plattner having a bad day. Maybe he had one bad snap, and we consider that a bad day for him. I can't remember Devin Ankle not being able to get a hold down. I can't remember Jack Bloomer not being able to get a hold down. 
And a, I mean, as much of a loss that can be on a punter is almost also on Simon McClannon yesterday. The punts continue to be terrible. Um, at least, you know, you didn't kick a ball out of bounds. You got to get those holds down. I get the snaps were bad. I mean, K-State benched Mason Olgeen in the game. They went to their backup long snapper. When's the last time a team had a bench a long snapper? But you think about the mistakes that were created here, and I question K-State kicking the trying the 53-yard field goal. Um, but I get why they did it, because they have so much confidence in Chris Tennant now, and the fact that he was able to bang in the, what, like, 47 yarder later in the game in the weather and everything. I think he would have been able to make the field goal they sent him out for if the snap and the hold are clean, but they're not. So you, you crap away three points right there. You screw up again on a PAT. That's four points. If K State has those four points, those last two drives, they're not trying to go down the field and get six. They're trying to go get three and let Chris Tennant win you a ball game again. So offensive line, not good. Special teams, not good. And really, I think it comes down, those are the two main culprits in this game. Everybody deserves a large chunk of blame. Everybody had their part in losing this. Everybody could have been better yesterday to avoid losing to a not very good Houston team. But if you're looking for the two biggest you know, problems in yesterday's game, it comes down to special teams and mainly the offensive line. Now, I want to put this up here. I know, I know we talk a lot about... PFF and what it is or what it isn't. But if you you kind of look in there at some of this stuff, I, I think it highlights what we're talking about yesterday, where Avery Johnson, people are probably going to think terrible day, which he did not have a great one. He was the second best graded player in yesterday's game. Like that to me signifies like conditions were tough. He did a lot of good things throughout it, but he was put in a, in a tough spot. But then you can kind of go down lower and see some struggles. The offensive linemen, uh, are all 10 and below in case they only played 19 guys on offense yesterday. This was K-State's second worst graded out PFF run blocking since the Tulane game. So Tulane was the only worst game this year in terms of blocking for the run, which, if I mean, if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense because uh, it felt like K-State had to be pretty heavy in, in trying to make plays through the air, and then also they got a defensive touchdown in that game. But – not a good showing yesterday for the offensive line, and uh, this is not a fun one for for K State to try and recover from and and get back out of. Yeah, we we've said PFF hasn't got gospel, but ooh, th those run blocking grades are what what is sad to me to think about. It's like those run blocking grades are still higher than I, I would have anticipated. Yeah, I think I'm looking. I'm looking around here at um, the. Uh, there are some other things that end up kind of costing you in this one. I mean, DJ Giddens kind of continues to drop balls that are thrown his way, and I don't know if they're impactful or not. Um, but you you think about like throughout the year, he's had a problem sometimes of they, those should just be ones you catch. I don't know if you get two yards or, or seven yards or ten yards, but at least catch it, see what happens. Um, and so there have been some drops there, but that's just, I think that's just hunting for other things. I really think the biggest issue comes down to, you couldn't block for the run. Nobody could get, could get out there. And then special teams put you in a tough spot all day. I, Drew, you said it yesterday. Houston started what at their own 42 was their average drive start yesterday. Uh, in, now some in of the that, second half. Yeah. In the same, and some of that is because they, they got one drive to start at the K state nine. Uh, well, but for it, the game, if you if you take out that they average starting at their thirty four, still yeah. So still, and, and K State average starting at their twenty five or twenty six. Yeah. So that eight yard gap. I mean, K State was one hundred and four or something in net starting field position coming into the game and got worse. And like you guys said, that's that's a major problem. K State had six drives start inside their twenty, mm -hmm. and Houston had none start inside their twenty four. I think Houston had six drives start outside their forty, in case they had two start outside their 40. So, um, and you, you mentioned that the short field is, it wasn't as drastic as the BYU game, but their three touchdown drives, K state Houston's offense had to move the ball 103 yards total. Cause part of that factored in the pass interference you mentioned, mm -hmm. but they had 103 yards to go 
and score three touchdowns. They got a 41-yard run on one of those drives. They got the 44-yard uh, pass down to the one on one of those drives. And then they had a 38-yard pass that set up their field goal. So they had explosive plays or uh, the short fields that led to all their points. And, and again, that was part of the Houston make the game ugly formula that K-State played right into. They also K-State lost the turnover battle. Also something that plays right into K Houston making the game ugly. And just every, I mean, I was confident going to this game because I thought surely K-State's not going to yeah. lose all three of these things that they can't lose. And they did. And, and well into the game, they they weren't yet. It wasn't yeah. until the turnovers yeah. like oh, that 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 strip sack fumble that K State recovered seemed like it was going to be the thing that propelled them. Uh, and then it was because that was a gift. That was a gift yeah. in the past game where Houston held the ball long enough in the pocket to where K State's pass rush could actually do something, and K State wasn't able to to get the job done there. So all right, that's enough on on football yesterday. Uh, not fun there. Real quick, just to update everybody on how the Big Twelve stock game is going. Uh, I think Drew's the only one that cares anymore because he has 41 points. Um, the next closest is me with 30, and then Fan with 23. But watch out, DY's coming for you with 20. Houston with a big day for him yesterday, um, despite the fact that Oklahoma State and KU have not won DY much in the last I don't know how long. Um, and then let's look around and see. Um, Drew has 25 wins. I have 21 wins for my teams. Fan has 18 wins, and DY has 15. So you can see where that's coming from. Uh, Drew, Drew squad also four top 25 wins. Uh, and his four teams they have a combined six instances of those three game win streaks where you kind of build momentum and that helps generate some points for you. The next closest, I have three, and two of them are because of BYU, and the other is thanks to Texas Tech. So it's not a fun time uh, doing this, but we'll uh, we'll get something in line for basketball here in the next week or so to do this as well. Sorry that you guys couldn't draft better. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't have touched Dave Aranda with a 10-foot pole, so good for you. Uh, also, my last pick, BYU, is the one that's performing easily the best for me. Um, which the same could be said for fan who has, who had Cincinnati with his last pick. Uh, and then D I mean, D Y got Colorado with his third pick and then Houston had a big day for him yesterday. They got two points. So, uh, that's what it looks like. I, I want to share this real quick. Um, we talk about how bad officiating might've been at times during the KU game. Uh, I was told yesterday by somebody affiliated with Houston, um, on the, on the sideline, it was getting later on in the game. They they wanted kind of like a personal foul late, whatever, on Damian Eli Leo. He, he and another Houston guy were kind of pushing and shoving. And I just kind of chuckled standing there next to him because earlier in the game, I had seen Jacob Parrish take a shot to the throat from like a Houston receiver uh, pretty well after the play. And so we kind of bonded over that with each other. And then the guy, he looks at me, he goes, is that a Prairie Dunes hat? I said, yeah. And he's like, oh, he's like, sweet. So he gave me a fist bump. Then we start talking about that. He's like, oh, yeah, we used to do whatever. Um, so he knew about that. And then we were talking and I we, I said, yeah, I mean, you don't have to tell us about officiating. We saw quite the show last week uh, with some wild misses. And he goes, yeah, we got to see the the report that, that you guys sent in talking about K-State to the Big 12 last week. I think what he said was K-State sent in six plays that they wanted the conference to look at. And on four of those six plays, the conference outright said that either the wrong call was made or a call should have been made on those four. Um, and I said, yeah, there were a couple of really bad missed face masks that I'm sure that they sent in. And then I said, and then probably the late hit on Avery. And I explained the one face mask on Dylan Edwards that came on the, the drive immediately after KU got a face mask called for him, which may have led to the – did that one lead to the Luke Grimm touchdown? I can't remember. Um, but anyways, and then he he was like, yeah, that was definitely one. And I said the late hit on Avery. He said, yeah, that was definitely one. So if you want uh, that to, to take home with you, K-State fans, to feel like – just keep riding the high off of extending the streak to 16 games. Uh, you did it in the face of the refs cheating against you. So 
there you go. Uh, that's that's what you have going on there. All right. Uh, last thing to note on football, we said it yesterday in the uh, instant reaction. Glass half full. K State just needs Colorado to lose. K State went out. K State will still go to the Big Twelve Championship game. So one Colorado loss, K State wins against Arizona State, Cincinnati, and Iowa State. It can be done. Um, but this team really probably shouldn't be thinking that way right now. They've got a lot of other problems to fix other than hoping that Colorado loses. So uh, we'll move on from there and see how that goes. Let's talk basketball now for the last little bit here as the season officially starts on Tuesday. It's the biggest thing going on on Tuesday. K-State, New Orleans from Bramlage Coliseum. Uh, we got our first look at the team in a game environment during the exhibition against Fort Hay State. Felt like once they kind of started to push things up, they let things come back down. And honestly, to me, not very impressed with that exhibition performance. And maybe I'm a little bit more disappointed because I have such high expectations for this team. I think they're going to be really good. I like going into the year that this team is probably, I don't know, look, looking at the last two weeks of the season, still being in the race for the Big 12 championship. I really think there's enough talent here that this staff can put it together. Um, but, I mean, does the exhibition performance change your opinion of this team at all, or how should we look at how that played out against Fort Hayes State and what it means moving forward, fan? Yeah, I mean, there's some concerns because, uh, you know, for – second year in a row um you've we've heard the staff highlight rebounding as something they want to focus on in Fort Hayes state rebounds 40 percent of their misses 50 percent in the second half and has 14 offensive rebounds against k-state um you know it, how much is that an issue in an exhibition you can go back and forth with how much you read into that well i think we'll see more in the next two weeks as, as we play real games and real teams but that is concern number one. Uh, concern number two, of course, is is shooting because we we have shooters and obviously we have one that's not afraid to shoot any shot, which I don't hate. But um, you, you got to shoot better than twenty nine percent from three, um, especially if you're going to take twenty eight of them. So um, those are the biggest two th and a little bit turnovers. You know, you, you have an eighteen percent turnover rate and have twelve turnovers against a D D two school. It's, it's not ideal um and then really you see three of your frontline players i think play well um coleman hawkins was good david gasson was good and i think uh cj jones was good you had pretty good performances from those three buddy rich had a good game but is that a good game because he's playing d2 post players probably so um there's some things but again let's see how this plays out you want to see more from several guys namely Doug um, McDaniel with the point guard spot. And then, you know, yeah, you know, I thought Max or, or uh, Hausen played, he played fine. You know, I don't know. You probably want a little bit better percentage, but if you're going to shoot 14 of them and maybe he's not going to shoot 14 every game, yeah, that, probably going to be more like eight to 10, but that was the other thing that I was going to bring up here. And maybe this is my biggest problem with how they performed in the exhibition and might concern me moving forward is that it didn't feel like they took it seriously. And I think a team that is all of these new pieces trying to come together, a staff that underperformed last year. Like I get that there were circumstances that contributed to that, but at the end of the day, you brought in a player in Quez Glover that had an injury history. So the fact that he got hurt and couldn't contribute maybe shouldn't have been a surprise to you. Um, you had a, a player in Naquan Tomlin that – had made some mistakes, and there had been conversations already preparing you that, hey, ice is pretty thin. Uh, maybe that shouldn't have shocked you that something happened to where he was not allowed to play. Um, so I thought that there would be a little bit better focus. And I think Jerome Tang was probably pretty upset about how they played on on Tuesday against Fort Hayes State. I think it's just about conveying the message to these players now and can you get them to lock in and not go out there and just be like, ah, you know, we're playing a D2 school. Like, let's get what we get. Just go out and have it. Like, I kind of think that's what Brendan Hosen was because I'm not sure he ever attempted that many shots in a game at Villanova. And I highly doubt that he attempts that many shots in a game again at K-State um, unless there's some weird circumstance and he's making every single one of them. So I think that's probably the number one thing that concerned me is that they didn't take it seriously 
That's why I'm hoping on Tuesday against New Orleans, we see a, a more real version of this team where it's, okay, this one actually matters. And even though it's also a crappy team that who knows, New Orleans might be worse than Fort Hayes State. Um, because it's something that's for real, you're going to take it more seriously. And I think they should beat New Orleans by 30 on Tuesday night. Yeah, I, I mean, for that reason of, I think that Jerome Tang is probably pretty pissed <laughs> off, for lack of a better term, that of how they played and how they handled themselves. Because we talked on, I think that was, that was Tuesday night of last week, or Tuesday afternoon, that uh, once Casey got up 20, it seemed like they really kind of shut it down and stopped caring. Uh, it, so I imagine because of that, you're probably going to see K-State in an ideal world, just come out and hammer New Orleans, who is not a good team really at all. So I, I think that you want better focus. You want, and I think that part of better focus is better rebounding. Like it, rebounding is an effort and focus stat more than anything else. Especially against Fort Hay State. Yeah, because I, I mean, I can count probably on more than two hands the amount of times that I saw Fort Hayes State get a rebound or an offensive rebound because just nobody wanted to box out. So you, you see probably a better effort, better rebounding, and, and probably smarter shots. It, it, and here's my thing with uh, Brendan Hosen shooting 14 threes uh, in the exhibition. I, I can probably only point to like one or two where I'm like, okay, you probably forced it here because he was pretty open on – probably 80 to 85% of those shots. So I, I'm good with him just letting him fly. He just has to knock him in. And, and that kind of goes with everybody because K-State was getting good looks and, and not making them. And I, I think that that's the concerning thing again for me because Rodney Perry has kind of turned into the, the whipping boy of the K-State coaching staff from K-State fans because he's like the offensive coordinator of, uh, the K-State staff, if K-State is getting good shots and not making them, <laughs> that's not the coach's fault. Like, you have to be better in that situation to make the shot. I and think, and I, I think they will make the shots. I, I'm not worried about one badge shooting night when I think you were just kind of jacking against Fort Hayes State. And I think it was just an unserious performance. Real quick, I want to throw this out on the, the rebounding. Uh, Fort Hayes State only had played guys that were 6'8 or shorter in that game. So, yeah, the rebounding should not have been a problem. Now, Fort A. State does have one player that is taller than 6'8. He is 6'10, and apparently he's not very good because Fort A. State only played him two minutes at the end of the game. So, there you go. Yeah, yep. so rebounding, you want it to be better and, and just better focus. I, I came away from that game not really feeling any different about how Casey could be the rest of the season. But just being disappointed that I didn't think that they took the exhibition game very seriously. And, and with a team that has so many new pieces and, and so many older guys, too, because just because of this is their first year doesn't mean that this is an inexperienced team. I mean, there's a lot of juniors and a lot of seniors on this team and, a lot of, and some grad transfers. And, and, and it seemed like they just didn't really take it very seriously. And, and I think that that is probably a bigger concern. Because with how the schedule lines up, what, what is stopping them from, like, not really caring against, a, a, like, an Arkansas Pine Bluff team, and they let them hang around, and, like, Arkansas Pine Bluff wins? Yeah. I, I, the, the, I mean, I thought up until the point – I thought the beginning of the second half, we saw a pretty good flash when K-State went on the run to get up 44-24. You're up 20. I thought – but then I thought – they kind of let the foot off the gas and played loose. And, you know, and the issue is we know now, unless there's changes, which I don't think there are, you can't do that for net ranking purposes when you play bad teams. And K-State can't afford to to let the foot off the gas to to lose those three or four spots that you might lose in a game like this when you play New Orleans, who I agree with you is a terrible team, K-State should wax them by 20 at least um, because they're just not very good. And you can't afford to have those slip-ups against bad teams anymore. You just can't do it. And you can't afford to, to make those games go from 20 points to 
uh, almost single digit wins when when you have teams put away. Um, and for the record, Housen's most attempts from three in a game were ten. We done it. He's done it twice in his career. So I think there was a little bit more freedom for him. I think Max Jones not playing probably has an influence on yeah. that as well a little bit. And and I would say that Max Jones is probably one of the guys that not seeing him out there probably hurts also the perception of this team because based off of the vibe that I got from Max Jones at Big 12 Media Day and how much it seems like he's been a, a legit player in the offseason leading up to this, I think he's probably going to be one of the keys in keeping this team focused. I think that he is a guy that it wants to get down to business, and I also look at him as a player that has had to kind of grind through the different levels to get to where he is, where you know he played at the at the D2 level in Florida. And then he got to transfer up and play D1 at Cal State Fullerton. Now he's getting his shot. He's got one year, one shot to play Big 12 meaningful basketball. And I don't think that he's a guy that's going to want it slip by. And I think that he's very mature. I was telling Drew, I, I can't remember a player ever at, at K-State that I thought was as well-spoken and just like, sincere and, and locked in when I talked to him. I mean, even, even, I mean, you can pick anybody out from, from past teams. Like there was just a confidence in the way he spoke and it was very, um, it was very absolute. Unlike me yesterday, when I tweeted out that K state was unlikely or that Houston was likely to have the league going into halftime. You know why I said the word likely people It's because I knew there was a chance that the cats could make a play. That's why you don't speak in absolutes all the time, unless it's talking about the fact that uh, uh, Dave Aranda is a fraud. Although we're starting to learn, you don't do that either. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yes, I think looking at Max Jones's presence out there, uh, that's probably the number one thing I'm most excited for come Tuesday, just to see if that kind of draws it in, and if the team, as long as the team is just focused, you shouldn't have a problem. Because you're right, fan, you can't have. Overtime against Oral Roberts again. Overtime against North Alabama. A 16-point loss at home to Nebraska. You can't play Chicago State tight and only win by seven points. I mean, those were pathetic performances last year by K-State. You can't do that this year. You can have one game where you don't show up like you know Oklahoma last year at home for K-State. It was unfortunate. It was not good, but you at least played a big 12 team at home. That was okay. Like I get that it cannot happen against these net plus two fifty schools that are going to be rolling in to uh, Manhattan this year. So and, and K-State scheduled in a way that you have to beat the crap out of the teams you play in your non-con because it's not very good. And you schedule a lot of these lousy net teams. So we'll see what it looks like from there. Hey, yeah, you but- won't be. Oh, I was going to say, you also want better focus for new Orleans because Cleveland state is, is all is, the game on Saturday and they, they're actually like capable uh, of winning a game against K-State. New Orleans, like so many things that have to go wrong for K-State where they get cold shooting again. They don't really look like they would care. They don't rebound well, but Cleveland State is capable and it's going to be one of the better teams in their conference. So like this is a game where you want to beat the crap out of New Orleans because Cleveland State's in that like 190 and the Ken Palm uh, range at the moment. So they're, they're at least like more capable. And, and you want to take gradual steps because, I mean, this K State team still isn't a, a complete package yet. And, and you want them to be just steadily getting better every single game. Yeah. My, my final thing is um, baseball has the Mendoza line. K State, when it comes to point guard play, has the Javon Thomas line. And Doug McDaniel's offensive rating was 0.73, which is nearing the Javon Thomas line of offensive rating. Um, K State can't have that. Like K State can't have that no. point guard play. Even with CJ Jones playing well, K State can't have a guy play almost 30 minutes and go one for eight. Uh, I mean, especially a guy that's supposed to be like one of your three best players. Yes, yes. that is. That'll be, I, and I, I'm not going to, I'm going to give him some time, but I'm just saying first impressions, not the greatest when he doesn't start and then he doesn't have a very efficient game. He also had two fouls like instantly when he came in. Yeah. Like 
it, it took him a little bit to get settled in. And, and I think it was big for him to like actually make a shot towards the end of the game. Yeah. So I think that we'll probably see a better Doug McDaniel on Tuesday. At, at least you would hope. The only thing that concerns me is Jerome Tang saying that they still need to get him to think more like a point guard and that so much of his mentality in the game is dictated by mi making or missing shots, which maybe that's something that can change if you're actually playing on a team that doesn't suck like Michigan has the last two years and you have a coach uh, that I think is a lot more serious of a coach than Jawan Howard was like there's going to be more accountability at K-State than there was at Michigan. I am 100% sure of that. Um, but it was a little concerning because also I think back to the number one thing I took away from Big 12 Media Day uh, of what somebody said was when David Gasson said that Doug McDaniel reminds him the most of Marquise Noel and some of the the passes that he can make and he the positions that he will get guys in. And – I think that's one of those deals where as long as you can get him in the mindset to do that, he is going to be a very special player for K-State, and he is going to provide that for him. But it's clear right now that he's not in that mindset yet with how he played against Fort Hay State and the fact that he didn't start because he should be one of your three best players. And in reality, he should be one of your two best players. Coleman Hawkins is your best player. Doug McDaniel should be your second best player. And it's a little concerning that that hasn't happened yet, but – Guys can grow. We've seen plenty of good basketball players in the past at K-State have their struggles or their moments where they're not starting or they're not doing certain things for whatever reason. They get out of it on the other side, and they're better for it. So uh, we'll see what that journey ends up looking like for K-State uh, starting on Tuesday and going from there. Uh, any thoughts on the big picture for K-State basketball this year that you want to get out before – the season officially starts where you all I can guide you. You can give whatever else you want, but you have to answer where you think they finish in the big 12 and what their seed in the NCAA tournament ends up looking like. And then uh, I don't know. I, I think the answer would be Coleman Hawkins. If I asked you who the, the best player on the team is going to be. So we'll see what else comes out of it, but where they finish in the big 12 and what they end up being in the NCAA tournament. I, I would say, K State, until I see more, is probably likely to finish fifth to seventh in the league, which sounds bad, but there are 16 teams and probably at least three or four will be top 10, top 15 type teams. So um, I think finishing fifth to seventh in the league probably puts K State between a five and seven seed in the tournament, which I, you know, it's tough because. You know, supposedly K State has spent as much money as anyone in the country. Um, you brought in all these new players. Um, you 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 you've done what you need to do. That you would hope that would be a team that competes for a Big Twelve title, and they might. But the league is so good that I think we can say, even not competing for a Big Twelve title, but being competitive in the Big Twelve is a pretty good, still a pretty good team. And then it's going to be about what you do in March. Can you make a second weekend? Because I think ultimately for most fans, if you if you don't win a, a conference title, making that second weekend is is the key. And even I think for a lot of fans, making a second weekend outweighs a conference title. We saw that in the Bruce Weber era multiple times. So I think can this team peak in March and, and compete in the Big 12 and then go on a run in March at least to the second weekend? I'm to the point where uh... – I would rather take the conference title over the second weekends because I just know that K State is going to crap the bed against a mid-major team in the Elite Eight. So that's not very fun. I don't think of those as successful seasons. Uh, I, I mean, especially 2018. It's just kind of like, eh, it was a fine year, but the the path was kind of lucky. And then you can't lose the Loyola, uh, even if Dean Wade is not healthy. You cannot lose the Loyola. So give me the conference titles and the fun of a a bigger sample size of games and just, you know, Oh, Hey, we had fun, three fun games. And then we, we crapped it out against so-and-so team from the <laughs> mountain West or so-and-so team from the American, or I guess at the time FAU was in, uh, what would they have been at the time? The, were they Sunbelt? Sun yeah. So even more embarrassing, the Sunbelt doesn't play basketball. So, okay. Uh, Drew, 
Where does K-State finish in the NCAA tournament seed? Uh, I'm going to say that K-State, even though we've only seen one game, because I think that they get some schedule luck a little bit with who they play twice, who they only play once, where they get some of the teams they only play once, as they finish as fourth. Uh, I mean, to, and that, that probably requires sweeping Oklahoma State and Arizona State, which is entirely possible. Uh, and with that, I think that Casey probably ends on that like four or five line in the NCAA tournament. Uh, but uh, like I said, like the, the schedule is, is pretty favorable. So to finish fourth or or better, because the, the schedule is so good that Casey could be in this for a while that you probably need to sweep Oklahoma State and Arizona State, and you need to beat Houston and Arizona since you get them both at home. Yeah, I was doing some math real quick. F- trying FAU, to... was, FAU was Cusa, guys. Come on, be, be, come on, give them the respect. Oh, okay. That was the 10th best that, conference, that, that not the 14th me. best conference that season. Yeah, that's even more embarrassing. Uh, look, it's I, I'm I'm not shy about the fact that I think this is going to be a good K State basketball team. Uh, even though I'm disappointed by how they played in the exhibition, I still think that they end up being pretty good. Um, I think they finished top four in the Big Twelve. I think that probably nets them uh, a three seed, and I really think that they go into that last stretch of the season with a chance to to do this thing, as long as. The one thing that this the talent is not lacking on this team, they're going to make shots. I'm not worried about that because they'll they'll be smarter about the ones they take. Um, it's going to be about well, I guess maybe they won't be smarter because that's the thing I'm worried about is if they they don't lock in mentally. I think that there are some pieces here where you could worry about that, but I think it ultimately does come together for them. And I look around, the schedule is pretty favorable. Um, you can probably sustain one loss at home, um, one or two losses the way the schedule works out. So, like, you can decide if it's against Houston, KU, or Arizona, but you can't have it be against all three if you think you're going to actually have that chance. I do actually think they have that chance. So, um, I think pretty highly of this team. I think they're going to be certainly a lot better than the idiot coaches who picked them eighth in the league. Um, Texas Tech, not a shot. Cincinnati, nope. We know they're frauds. And then uh, we'll see. I mean. Scott Drew, he kind of keeps getting talent, but he's underachieved ever since he he won the national title. Is it any coincidence that shortly after that is when Jerome Tang left him? I don't know. People are saying. Uh, and then you look around. KU and Houston will be good. Uh, Iowa State, they are the Oklahoma State football version of basketball. Maybe a little bit better. I think the ceiling's still a little bit higher there. I don't think what they did last year was such a smoke and mirrors act. But I don't think that they are needing to be crowned as this oh top five team to start. I just don't think that's what they are. Um, but you know, if you're allowed to to punch and get away with assault uh, through the league, Houston was able to do it. Iowa State was able to do it most of the last year. Uh, maybe you maybe you will finish strongly. Um, Iowa State is the one that I would say. I think is has the disappointing finish from where they they were picked to finish in the league. I don't think they'll be quite as good. Uh, who is the disappointment in the Big Twelve this year for you guys? Cincinnati. I should have known. I I, I think it I think it won't be as dramatic as football, but I think one of those top five teams that are all top ten ish teams, Houston, Iowa State, KU, Arizona, Baylor, one of them is going to fall and, and be a middle of the pack to, to lower tier Big 12 team. I don't know who it's going to be. I would I would guess, you know, your picks of Baylor um, relying on young talent and then Iowa State maybe not coming together, even though they return so much as one of the two most likely. Um, but it's going to be I, – I just think that this league is going to cause chaos for basketball, not in the same type of way as football, but I think we're going to see a little bit of it. I I think Arizona might be in, in play here to be uh, the one that does that because I, I think adjusting to a new league um, is something to, to keep in mind. And you look at Houston, 
they had made deep runs in the NCAA tournament. They had done some of these things that like it made sense that they would be able to come in last year and and not really skip a beat. Arizona has some stuff with Tommy Lloyd and some of the, the players that they're built on where obviously they lost to Princeton in the NCAA tournament two years ago uh, in the first round, which was disappointing. They, they kind of have some areas where they will falter at times. And you look at their schedule uh, and how it plays out for them. They have to play. These are just their notable games. They play at Cincinnati. They get Baylor at home. They play Iowa State twice. They play on the road at K-State. Uh, they play at Kansas to end the regular season. They play Baylor twice. They, they do get Houston at home. Um, but the schedule is a little bit tricky for them. And I think that it could take a toll on them playing 20 games in the Big 12 when you're not fully used to it. You also add in that they're going to have one of the bigger um, travel asks out of everybody else in the league. So uh, the t there's talent there, no doubt about it. I think Tommy Lloyd is a good coach, but I do think that there's a little, I don't know, for whatever reason, they, they, they have something that might hold them back there. So I think Arizona and Iowa State are the two towards the top that, that might fall back. but. I think I, I, I say Iowa State because I think it could happen, but I'm also just so sick of hearing about how good they are. The margin for Iowa State doing what they did last year versus being, you know, uh, a nine seed in the NCAA tournament to me seems pretty thin. So we'll just see if uh, more teams take a toll on them and the fact that some teams are going to be better this year. K State will be a better team than they were last year and they still split with Iowa State. Cincinnati will be a better team than they were last year. Sorry to tell you that, Drew. Um, I, I, there, I mean, Baylor will be better than they were last year than Iowa State. like all these things. Oh, and by the way, just to, so Iowa state fans are excited and happy. Um, you do have to play in Allen Fieldhouse this year, so you don't get to, to skip that out. And, oh, you also have to play at Houston this year. So you don't get to miss that as well. Um, and you play at Arizona. So the schedule doesn't flood open as much as it did last season so there you have it that's uh some big 12 basketball talk uh anything else that you guys want to add before we get out of here today i don't know uplifting words to people for how bad ba football was yesterday or any basketball thoughts i, I mean I, I completely understand why people are down on football and frustrated with that loss um, but k-state still has three games left still has 10 win regular season in play, although it will be difficult and <clears throat> gets two home games after the, the, the bye week. So um, I, I would say be frustrated, but eventually you just got to move on and, and support this team. Cause I still think they're pretty good. I still think we have pretty good coaches. I still think we have pretty good players. Um, just not good enough to avoid that kind of letdown that we saw yesterday. Um, but this team still, pretty solid. And um, at the end of the day, if you can't be satisfied with a 10 and two and even nine and three regular season at K-State, um, I, I don't think there's any coach in the country that will be in play for us uh, in the future. So that's number one. And number two, enjoy the basketball season. I think it's going to be a fun year. I agree with you guys that they're going to be good, even though I don't have them quite as high as you guys do, but I, I do think this is going to be a fun team once they come together. So you don't want Chris Kleiman fired for losing yesterday? I don't think saying? we need – I don't want Kleiman fired, Klanderman fired, or Riley fired at this point. Yet. I think, oh. I think, I think you know, the season still has to play out before I would make a declaration like that. But, but Kleiman has proven he will fire people when the time needs to, to be done. So I don't, I'm not worried about that either. Yeah, frustration. Frustration yesterday is valid. If you watched instant reaction, you could see that I, I was wearing that on my face for most of the time. Uh, so frustration yesterday valid. Basketball will be fun. I I have a lot of high hopes. I think that this team could be really really fun. Maybe not quite the same like levels of fun as uh, Drone Tank's first uh, mm -hmm. season with like how fun that team was to watch, but I think it'll be pretty close. I mean, I, I have already said that I think Coleman Hawkins gets the first triple double in K-State basketball history this year. So I think that would be pretty fun. Uh, I want to give a shout out. This is my final thought. 
Shout out to Jerome Tang and K State basketball for instead of playing on Monday night, playing on Tuesday night because Monday there are a thousand games going on. There are only eleven college basketball games being played on Tuesday uh, because it is election night, I guess. Uh, so you, you have that going for you, uh, but. <laughs> I like that they decided, hey, you know what? We're going to be for the people. We're going to give them some basketball to watch. So that will be a fun time. Uh, actually, there are going to be four Big 12 teams in action on Tuesday night. So 25% of the league starts their season on Tuesday. Texas Tech hosts Bethune-Cookman. Uh, Arizona State hosts Idaho State. And BYU hosts Cent Central Arkansas. Those are There's only one other power conference team that plays on Tuesday, and it's Washington at 9 o'clock. So... Uh, there you have it. You got some basketball on Tuesday if you want to avoid election coverage. That's a tight hour show for everybody. We're out of here. We're going to go uh, wipe away the tears from the Houston loss, move on, enjoy the bye week with some basketball, and we'll be back again next Sunday with some hoops to talk about and getting ready for Arizona State and football. So for Drew Galloway, KSU fan, I'm Mason Vo. Thank you for watching and listening to the KSO Show.